Hey church family, as we begin the service this morning, I just wanted to provide you with a couple quick updates. Uh, first of all, everything went smooth this week with the church closing. And so I know this has been a bittersweet uh, time for many of us as we uh, say goodbye uh, to the old church building on 214 Farrell, but also a sweet time as we look forward uh, to the new church. Uh, on a practical note with that, uh, I know many of you are mailing in your contributions uh, over this time with COVID, and I would ask you to continue to do that as that's a very uh, quick and easy way uh, to get our giving uh, in. Uh, but one thing to note is if you could change the address instead of 214 Farrell, change it to just the P.O. Box 680. So P.O. Box 680, uh, Platte City. And that way we make sure that the checks get to us. The other thing too is in a couple weeks on August 9th at 6 o'clock, we are going to do the prayer rocks. And so over this last year, I know that many of you have filled out prayer rocks with uh, people that you're praying for, or maybe a certain scripture. And so again, on August 9th at six o'clock, we're gonna go up to the new church property and put those rocks around the entrance of the new church. And what is exciting about that is it's very symbolic of putting those prayer rocks in the ground as we walk in and out of the building uh, each Sunday that it has been prayed over. And so uh, grab your rocks if you uh, haven't turned those in already. Uh, if you haven't had the chance to fill out a rock, we'll have those available uh, at the property. And so really hope that you can attend. The other thing is in this transition time period, uh, we are meeting in the student building, which is 225 Main Street. And so it's a little bit maybe tricky to find if you haven't been in the student building before, but uh, we'll be out front. Uh, we'll have some signage and things like that. So uh, if you could park on Main Street, that's great, but also know that you can park on 2nd Street. The other thing with that is, um, though we're able to get about 30 to 35 people uh, in the building with social distancing, we really need you uh, to register just so we know how many are coming. And that will also help us know if we should uh, add another service or two. So if you can go to the church website, if you can pull up uh, the church app, uh, you can register in that way and again help us to know who is coming. Well, uh, this morning I'm going to read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 uh, starting in verse 7 and then I'm going to read through the end of the chapter if you'd follow along with me. So Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 starting in verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for how you are moving and working in our church. And Lord, we uh, know that this life is temporary. And Lord, I pray that we will remember that and Lord, you will call that to our attention. So that Lord, that we know and will work toward things that are, are eternal. Lord, many people in our community and around our nation and the world, Lord, need to come to faith in you. And Lord, press that upon us that this life is short so that, Lord, that we work hard uh, to share the gospel, uh, to love others, and Lord, bring more people into your kingdom. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
So it's official. We have entered our period of wilderness wandering. My buddy Rick says, nobody goes to the promised land without passing through the wilderness. No, no, that may be silly to think of it that way. But I do feel like God has called us to something that is unique and supernatural. I mean, when he called us to acquire that land and to construct a new home that would be sort of a a gospel lighthouse for our neighbors, that would sit up on the hill and people could see it from in town and and people could stream to it and we could stream out from it. It's a spiritual endeavor, this new home that God has called us to build. And in order to take hold of the new, we've got to let go of some old And even though it's been hard, precious ones, last Sunday when we gathered together uh, for that final walkthrough and to worship together, there were just some scriptures that were so heavy on my mind. Like, for instance, when, when Moses was getting ready to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, and that was all they had ever known. It was all they had ever known, right? And it wasn't good, but it was all they had known. And he said, it finally came down to one particular day. And that's what it felt like because we'd been dreaming about it for a long time. We'd been counting down the days for so long, but last Sunday was the day, the day. Moses, when he was telling the people about it, he said, this is going to be the night that you take and you, you, you put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and you eat the Passover meal. And here's how you eat it. You eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt. You eat it with sandals on your feet, with your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. And when your children ask you in generations to come, what does this mean? You tell them. You tell them, God led us to a moment. And we prepared for it, and we dreamed for it, and we prayed for it. But there came a moment when we had to step out. That's what this moment is. Joshua. Joshua, when he was leading the people into the promised land, he said, here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to know, Joshua chapter 1. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So be strong and courageous. That's what it's going to take for us to make this move, for us to make this jump from where we've always been to where we're always going to be. I've got this picture in my head. This picture in my head of a bullseye, you know? And and the, the outermost part of the bullseye, you know, the whole big structure. Well, that is the people who are looking on, the crowd that's looking on saying, I wonder what that building is that's being built there as they're driving past. People who are sitting over at the park and they're looking across the road saying, you know, when that new church comes, we ought to go see what that's all about. They're the crowd. They're the people who don't know yet, but they need to know. They need to know what we found in Jesus. And then there's this inner ring, people who have been with us all along. People who have been coming all along and, you know, they got the hat, they got the t-shirt, they got the whole thing, you know. I mean, if you were to, if you were to call it the, the blue crew or if you were to call it Red Friday, they're the fans. They're the ones that say, you know what, I'm for it. I'm for it. I'll buy tickets. I'll be there. I'll do whatever it takes. And, you know, I'm there. I'm there. But a lot of those folks, a lot of those folks are not the people who make up that inner circle, the core the core, the center ring of that bullseye, the people who have said, you know what? I'm going to sacrifice to make it happen. Blood, sweat, tears, my life, my fortune, my sacred honor. I'm going to, I'm going to be part of pushing this stone up the hill until it takes on a life of its own and it becomes this, this thing that reaches our community for Christ, this city on a hill that cannot be hidden. I want to be a part of seeing that happen. Over these last weeks with the, with the social distancing, it's put us to the test because there are a lot of us who see ourselves on the same team, right? And we are, we are. But there are some people who have said, you know what, even if I can't see you face to face, I'm going to shoot you an email because I don't want you to grow weary and well-doing. Or they've said, you know what, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to reach out and send you a message on Facebook just because I want you to know we're in this together. We're still part of this together. So I've been thinking a lot about what does it mean to have a core? If you were launching a new church or relaunching an existing church, you would gather together a core team of people. 
a core team of people who would have this shared vision, a core team of people who would be so ignited by what they're at work to do that they'll just sacrifice. They'll, they'll sacrifice their time. They'll, they'll, they'll sacrifice their labor. They'll push. They'll pull. They'll do whatever it takes. They'll share it with their friends. That's the core group. So over these next weeks, however many weeks it's going to be between leaving 214 Farrell Street and entering into our new home, over these weeks, I want us to treat it like this is our core training. Like this is, this is our building our core group of people. Last Sunday, uh, as we were preparing, it dawned on me that we were almost 47 years to the day from when that sanctuary at 214 Farrell, when that sanctuary was dedicated to the Lord, it was July 23rd, 1973. Well, we close on the building. We hand the keys over to the new owners on July 22nd, 2020. 47 years almost to the day, right? And so I was kind of geeking out on this, and I thought, I wonder if there's anything special in one of the 47 chapters in Scripture, right? You know, whether Isaiah 47 or Jeremiah 47 or Psalm 47. Here's what I found in Ezekiel 47. Let me share this with you. In Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel has this vision. And, and in the vision, this man, this, this, this divine representative comes and, and he brings him to the temple. The temple, the only place Ezekiel has ever known for worship. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. Now, this is out of the ordinary because water doesn't flow out of the temple. He says, the water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. And then he brought me out through the north gate, and he led me around outside and the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. So this was, not just, this was not just a spill. This was a source. This was a spring. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, about a third of a mile. He measured off a thousand cubits, and then he led me through water that was ankle deep. So this trickle was becoming a stream. He measured off another thousand cubits and he led me through water that was knee deep. So it went from ankle deep to knee deep. So this is becoming a thing, not just a, not just a thing that's going to come and then it's going to go. This is becoming a thing. And then he went another thousand cubits and he led me through water that was up to the waist. And then he measured off another thousand, but now it was a river. It was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. A river that no one could cross. And he asked me, son of man, do you see this? Do you see that, that I'm up to something? That's more than you could have asked or imagined. I'm up to something that's just bigger than you. I'm up to something that is going to make a difference and it's going to change the geography and it's going to change the landscape and it's going to change everything about this place that you call home. He says, he led me back to the bank of the river, and when I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. And he said to me, this water flows toward the east, through the, through the desert region, goes down into the Arabah, the desert, where it enters into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. The lowest place on planet Earth. The Dead Sea, where any drop of water that flows that far down has no life left in it at all. Nothing can live in that water. He says the river flows down through the region, through the desert region where it enters the Dead Sea and when it empties into the sea, the salty water becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because the water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows... Everything will live. When I read that, I was like, yes, Lord. Yes, this is what you're at work to do with us. This is what you're at work to do through us. We get to partner with you to see your kingdom come and your will be done here where we live. To see families that have been caught up and just, just killed, you know? Because of all the, all the baggage that has gone into their lives and all the hurt and all the, all, the, all the hardships that have gone in. 
But the water of life, wherever the water of life flows, everything will live. That's what we get to be a part of. We get to be a part of seeing the gospel light up our entire community. We get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of seeing what God is going to do. I mean, God has, used, God has used this place before, you know, and he's used us before. But there was just this sense that everything was just a little harder than it had to be. And so God called us, God led us, and we're establishing this new thing. And some people are going to get so jazzed about that that they're going to say, you know what, count me in. I'm part of the core. I'm part of this new thing that God is doing that is, that is going to change the geography, the spiritual landscape of our community. Count me in. I'm going to put my shoulder to the wheel. Count me in. I am part of this. I want to be part of the core. I remember, I remember that part in Deuteronomy where, where Moses was speaking. He said, look, this is so significant that this is going to become the thing that you pass on to your children and to your children's children. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. These commands I give you today to be on your hearts impress them on your children talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up tie them like symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates this changes everything right i mean that's that's the kind of thing that galvanizes a core group of people together to set out and do something new that's never been before to see something right that becomes a light to this entire area, that we get to be part of the answer to the prayer that says, let thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth like it is in heaven, right? Let your kingdom come, let your will be done here in our community, in our lives, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, like it is in heaven. Man, I've got this dream. I've got this dream of having, having people who are so aware of what God has done in my own life that I can share it that quick, that I, can, that I can tell people, here's what my life was like before I came to know Jesus. And then there was this moment when my heart was awakened, and since then God has changed my... You ever heard of the cardboard testimonies where somebody you know, holds up a, a cardboard and it says, you know, addicted, and, and, uh, and then they flip it over and they say, forgiven and set free, right? Just stuff like that, you know? And it tells about, you know, here's what my life was like before I came to know Jesus. And then I came to know Jesus, and here's what my life has been like since then. You know, a core group, that core group needs to be made up of people who can look and say, my life has been changed by Jesus. My life has been changed by Jesus. Not only that, not only that, but I dream of people who are not only able to share their story, but they're able to share Jesus' story. That God so loved the world that He sent His only Son. And that even though people like you and me have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, with a heart that says, God, I'm sorry. God, come into my life. You can know Jesus. You can have the same kind of hope in Christ that we've all found. Hmm. I'd be lying to you if I said that this is easy. I'd be lying to you if I said that these last months in preparation for handing over the keys to where we've worshipped together all this time, I'd be lying to you if I said that had been simple or easy or not caught up in a lot of emotional sort of questioning. Are we doing the right thing? Are we sure that we're sure that this is what God is calling us to do? And as we came down to the final Sunday together, there was some of that catch your breath moment of saying, there's no turning back. I was thinking about this line and I had to look it up. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where Paul talks about being pressed down. We're we are pressed. And that's kind of what it felt like. In fact, over these next weeks, as we gather together as a core group, as we drill down on the things that really matter, that we need to be sure of, it's going to feel like we are being pressed and, and, and sort of 
distilled into an essence, right? Pressed, pressed so much that all the things that were extraneous things get kind of squeezed out, pressed and, and sort of distilled down so that all of the impurities are sort of evaporating away, pressed and distilled down to an essential, right, of the gospel in us that, that binds us together. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, look, we have this treasure, but it's in jars of clay. It's in jars of clay. It's not in, it's not in jars that, you know, uh, 214 Pharaoh was a jar of clay. The new place that we build, it's going to be a jar of clay. We have this treasure. The treasure remains the same. We have this treasure, but it's in jars of clay, and it's to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Precious ones, this is not about establishing us as a force. No, this is about saying Jesus makes all the difference, always has, always will. This treasure in jars of clay to show that the power is from God and not from us. He says we're hard-pressed on every side, right? And when you gather to worship together in the student ministry building, you're going to say, wow, this is not the same as when we were over there and we had, all, we had room to spread out and we had, we had everything we needed. And, 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 and this is going to feel... This is going to feel so temporary. This is going to feel, this is going to feel so... In fact, that's, that's kind of what drove me to 2 Corinthians 4 because Paul said at the end of this chapter, he said, this momentary light affliction is working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight and glory. That's what this time between leaving the old and going into the new is about. It's about a momentary light affliction. If it was easy... I don't know that we would learn from it what we need to learn from it. He says this momentary light affliction is working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight and glory. He says we are hard pressed on every side. And that's what these weeks have felt like as we've, you know, cleaned out and thrown out and packed up. It, it's felt like being hard pressed on every side as we've, as we've changed our schedules and the rhythms of our life to, to make the videos that we would share and continue to preach the way that we preach and, and gather together the way we gather together. Hard pressed on every side, you bet, it's been challenging. Hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. He said, we're perplexed. <laughs> you bet, you bet. A lot of head scratching been going on in these last weeks. A lot of head scratching been going on. How do we do this? Where do we go from here? How do we make this work? How do we stay together, united together as a church family, as a core group of people? How do we, how do we make sure we don't lose what we have? Perplexed, you bet, but not in despair. Persecuted? I don't know so much about that, although I will say some of the restrictions that we've felt, you know, when, when people have been going every other direction, but church is kind of clamped down on, I don't know, persecuted, maybe, I don't know, but not abandoned. Struck down, maybe, but not destroyed. He says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in us. That is that distilling it down to the essence that I was talking about. Just taking all the things that you look and say, you know, I'm blessed because, and saying, you know what? I am blessed because I know that I know that I know Jesus. I know that I know that I belong to Him. I know that I know that I have found hope that I can share with the people I love. That is what it means. That is what it means to be pressed and condensed and distilled until we come down to the essence of the core of this gospel that we will carry in this momentary light affliction that when we look back on it, when we look back on it, we're going to say, you know what? Those were some of the best times that we ever knew in our faith. Those are some of the times that we had to, we had to work without a net. Those are some of the times that we had to go without a map. Those are some of the times that we're going to look and we're going to say, we learned a new kind of dependence on the Lord. Let me give you a warning, though. Because I've also known some people that went into times like that, times of great sacrifice, times of great focus, but who didn't stay plugged into the core, didn't stay plugged in with one another 
in the family of faith kind of started going it on their own and, and, and trying to work in their own power, push with their own strength. And people like that, instead of looking back in those, on those times and saying they were some of the best times of my life, they look back on those times and they say, that's when I experienced a burnout like never before. That's when I experienced a kind of disappointment and disillusionment like never before. Precious ones, in this time of wilderness wandering for us, there's a spiritual warfare to press into and pray into. A kind of prayer that would say, God, in Jesus' name, hold us together. Hold us together. Knit us together with a purpose and a vision that is bigger than us. It's just bigger than any one of us, bigger than we could do on our own, and it's, it's from you. This is from you and not from us. Precious ones, over these next weeks, I want us to spend some time figuring out how to drill down on your personal relationship with Jesus and how to share it with anybody you love. I want to press down and press in on what it means to be the church together in this place, called to this place and to this moment. I want us to press in on what it means to genuinely treasure one another, to, to hope for the best in each other, to call the best out of each other and to spur one another on to love and good works. I want us to press in to what it means, what it means to be a part of reaching this community in ways that we never even dreamed of reaching, right? I mean, we've talked about for our neighbors, but what would it mean? What would it mean if, if our church had roots that reached into every neighborhood of this community, that, that reached up to the north and reached down to the south, that reached to the east and to the west, that reached into your home and your neighborhood? What would that look like? What would that feel like? I want us to press into all of that. But I guess more than anything else, right now, right now, I want to invite you to know where you belong. So I'm going to ask you to ask this question of the Lord. Picture that bullseye, right? With the, with the, the crowd, the sort of interested crowd, but it's just a crowd. They don't even know if they know Jesus yet. Or that, or that fan base, that fan base that says, you know what? I've been part of that church for a long time. That's my church. Or are you part of the core? Are you part of the core that says, this is my church? And I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to help make it happen. And so I'm going to ask you to ask the Lord, Lord, in Jesus' name, would you, where do you want me to hit and stick on this bullseye? Lord, how do you want to use me and my family to be a part of this? Let me pray into that with you. Oh, Father. Oh, Father, to be, to be a part of something that changes the spiritual landscape of our community. To be part of something, Lord, that brings life wherever it touches. Lord, to be part of something that you are at work to do in our world. Oh, Father, it's almost more than we could ask or imagine to find where you're, where you're at work and to join you there. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that that this would be a time when you take us and you draw us down so deep into our own experience of you, that, that we go deep into our soul to find that part of you that has changed us. And Father, then in Jesus' name, that you would explode out of us with springs of living water, Lord, that would reach all the way to the people we love. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, precious ones, let me invite you to nail that down today. Do you know that you know Jesus? Do you know that you know that Jesus, who loved you even when you were dead and he made you alive, he flowed all the way to you? Here's the prayer. God, you know me. God, you know everything there is to know about me. I need you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. God, I need you. If that's you, if that's your prayer, 
Precious ones, I want to invite you to not waste another day. Reach out, reach out, and let us know you want in. Let us know where you want to hit and stick on that bullseye so that together we can become the people God has called us to be. And when it's time, we can go boldly as servants of the Lord into this brave new day. I love you guys. I can't wait to see what God is going to do. And I love being your pastor. See ya.